yes, yeah, so I've been living in Japan now for about 14 years. Um, and originally, I just went to Japan quite casually, um, just to just to work as a teacher. And I wasn't planning to stay so long. Um, but the longer I stayed, the more I tried to find out about Japan, about the kind of things I'm always interested in, which is social history and uh, aspects of underground culture. Um, so obviously I was in Japan, so it made sense to start researching about that in Japan. I mean, it wasn't my original interest. Um, I mean, it, I might have gone to another country and done a book about other other countries' uh, social histories. But um, after being in Japan for a few years, I started to look around and do some research, and I realized what a rich history there is um, in the 50s, 60s, and 70s, and how there's some information about it, but really the there isn't so much, actually, and a lot of information was not so clear. So I wanted to try and uh, just uh, clarify a lot of information for myself, and then I realized I, I could do it for other people as well. Uh, but my, my, my background is partly history, but also uh, literature and theater. So I, originally I was focusing my research on uh, underground arts movement, particularly performing arts, um, that I thought I would be my main focus. And so I was looking at people like Shuji Teriyama, who's a famous film director and, uh, and a theatre artist. But then I realised I was as interested in the general social movement, if not more interested in that side. And gradually that became bigger and bigger. And the, the arts and culture section kind of became a, yeah, a sort of a section rather than the main thing. But yeah, originally my approach was a little bit different. Um, I mean, I come. I was born in the early '80s, um, so I grew up under Thatcher and then New Labour in the United Kingdom. Um, it was a time when you know the, the left in the UK was very much experiencing a decline, and it was the end of big ideologies. It seemed so. I didn't grow up with a. I didn't grow up with a strong sense of left wing ideology because that was seen as the past. And so I think there was a kind of a absence there for me. And so um, maybe, I, maybe my motivation was partly uh, because I, I lacked that history myself. I didn't have that kind of left-wing, strong activist kind of history in the 80s and 90s. And so perhaps I could look back to history and try to, um, try to compensate for, for my own lack of experience. So you were saying that uh, your research had a focus on the 50s, 60s and 70s. This is all the time we want to talk about. When we talk about 1968 in Japan, I think it's necessary to start a bit earlier, to start in the time after the Second World War. Um, Japan was a monarchy and it was one of the countries who fought on the side of Nazi Germany. What happened then? How was the political situation in Japan after the Second World War? Yes, you're absolutely right. You have, you have to take it back to the end of the war. Um, because so much about what was happening at the end of the 60s has its roots in, in what happened and what did not happen after the end of the war. So what did not happen is that uh, you didn't see a proper democracy suddenly appearing. Um, you didn't see the Emperor, Emperor Hirohito, who many people would argue has war responsibility, responsibility for some of the things that happened in the war. He, he did not go to prison or he didn't, he didn't lose his, his position as emperor. So these, none of these things happened. There was, there was a glimmer of hope for a while that Japan might truly become a, a democratic country. And, uh, you know, the, the, um, the, the Western occupying forces uh, um, allowed labor unions and they, they, um, they legalized the, the Communist Party and other political, political parties and they gave freedom of speech again. All these things have been of course, banned under the fascist period. But then quite quickly, as the Cold War started and things in East Asia changed quite dramatically with China and Korea, uh, the, the pressure was suddenly put on. And uh, during the occupation of Japan until 1952, um, the, things went in the opposite direction. And suddenly what happened in 1952 at the end of the occupation was a very a very conservative establishment was left in power. Many of the people who had been part of the, the war machine, the war government, were still in power in Japan. I mean, some people were put on trial, but many people, many people were allowed to continue. Um, 
one of the later prime ministers of Japan was in fact actually in prison as a, as a war criminal for a while. Um, so in many ways, the, after the war, there's this hope of a, of a true liberal democracy or, or a kind of democracy as we might think of it today was, was lost. And the situation instead was this very strong conservative establishment and with a very strong uh, American United States military presence in Japan. And very much Japan was included in the United States side of the Cold War right from the beginning. Lots of, lots of military bases and Okinawa, the large prefecture of the South, remained U.S. territory until the 1970s. And so Japan was basically, although it was, again, independent officially, it was essentially um, you know, a vassal state of the United States. When we talked here in our radio about 1968 and other countries, we realized yeah, 1968 is nothing that came from one moment to the other. 1968 was uh, the result of a longer process. And one part of this process was uh, that after the Second World War, there have been a series of left-wing groups that was founded, the so-called New Left, groups that were looking for a new orientation beyond the traditional left-wing movement. Um, you said that there, after the Second World War, um, yeah, some of the old left wing groups were legalized again. Um, is there something similar to the new left in Japan? Yes, absolutely. I mean, there's a lot of parallels between what happened in Japan and what happened in Europe and America. And, and the, the emergence of the new left is definitely a, 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 a point we can compare. Um, the situation is a little bit different in, in, in Japan, of course. Um, but uh, yeah, so basically you have the, the old left as we now think of it, basically the Communist Party, Socialist Party, and the major union, labor union federations. So they were, they were strong in the, in, the, in the late 40s and 50s. And they, you know, the, the Communist Party today exists and is very, still much of a very strong part of the Japanese parliament today in the opposition. Uh, but uh, quite quickly in the 50s, you see new, new types of activists and new groups emerging uh, in direct opposition to the old left, particularly the Communist Party. And a lot of this comes from the way the Communist Party was, it, it, it gave up, it officially renounced its, uh, its aim to take, you know, take control of Japan by, by, a, a, by a militant or a, 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 you know, a violent revolution. And also it was you know, pro-Soviet and things like that, which after, the, after what happened in Hungary was also heavily criticized by people on the left. So it was quite quite a painful experience, but the new left, the, the left in Japan began to split and this new left emerged. And, uh, you know, the, these were quite uh, quite traumatic experiences where people broke away from the, the, le the Communist Party and the Communist Party became an enemy. You know, so now, now for these new left groups, The, the, there were many enemies. There was, the, of course, the, the nation state, the Japan, and the, the imperialist state, also capitalism, uh, also the far right, the ultranationalists, but also the Communist Party. So the old left was as much an enemy as, as the other enemies. And this is a very, very difficult um, division in the left, and that, was, that has never really healed. Um, I mean, exactly where we define where and when we define the new left in Japan is a little bit difficult, and some people have different opinions. But yeah, the first groups emerged in the 50s, um, but many people start talking about the new left seriously from about the, the mid-60s onwards, and the Japanese word for new left became, became common and became famous at the end of the 60s. And that's when definitely the new left, like, like in other countries, was, was the dominant force in, in, in social movements. Yeah, I think we can come back to the new left-wing movement and also to the yeah, specific groups of the new left. First, I would like to talk about uh, the students who are maybe also a part of this new left-wing movement. One thing that happened in the most countries in this year, 1968, was the protest of the students. The students protested against their specific situation in the society and they started to discuss the whole education system and the new university system. Also in Japan, there's been a students' movement. Um, How was the situation of the students in the 60s in Japan? Yes, the, stu the student movement was the driving force of the new left in Japan. Um, and, and in general, um, most of the social movements in the 60s. Um, the, the way 
the period is remembered now as a little bit, maybe a little bit too dominated by the student groups, but because uh, there were also worker groups and non-student groups. But nonetheless, the student groups were were the most important, and um, you kind of see in in two main waves. So originally, there was in the at the end of the fifties and early sixties a, a strong movement against the renewal of the security treaty between America, United States, uh, and Japan. And the treaty is called AMPOL. And so this was this had been um, signed in 52, um, but when it came out for renewal, uh, there was a big movement to see it um, to see it to see it changed, or for the government not to renew it. Um, this was again uh, the, the student movement was very strong in its opposition. And this was a huge movement. There were tens of thousands, um, hundreds of thousands some, sometimes on the streets of Japan, particularly Tokyo. And uh, it famously led to uh, uh, one, one student, one female student was killed during the protests. Um, and that was sort of seen as the, the very much the climax of the movement in 1960. And then there's a second sort of wave of student groups towards the end of the, the 60s. And this point now, I mean, like in other countries, uh, the student population began to increase by a lot. Many, many new new students were joining universities uh, because the population had, had risen. And uh, they were finding a, a lot of problems. One, of course, was the political problems, but also just in general, the universities, uh, they were very angry about the facilities, what they were paying for, and uh, the kind of situation they had where they were this very hierarchical relationship between the professors and the students. So there was a reaction against that. Also, the, the national universities it was seen as they were part of the imperialist state as well. And then at the private universities, there was seen as corruption with the use of the money of the universities. So some of the Campuses began to uh, began to experience strikes and uh, occupations of the buildings from the late 60s onwards. Some of these were about local issues, but quite quickly they began to take on much bigger bigger meanings and began to began to see each other as a as a national movement. And so the the campus movements that were that were established at each university. Uh, tried to join together and form a single national movement um, at the end of the 60s. And unfortunately, it didn't, it didn't last very long. Um, they had one famous, very large rally in, in Tokyo at the end of the 60s. But uh, you can see that although the, the, campus movements, the campus movements were spread out around different universities, they were also trying to form a single large movement. And it's from these students that a lot of the new left groups uh, found their recruits. And so the students were, first of all, protesting on the campus and not going to classes for you know, a whole year. Um, and then uh, the riot police were coming onto campus and there were you know, battles between students and police on campus. But also then the, the, the new left groups were taking the students out of the campuses and onto the streets to protest in other movements, um, anti-war movement, anti-Vietnam war, uh, against the occupation of Okinawa, and so on. So one of the radical left students groups was called the Sengaku Ren. They became very famous. They are also known in other countries, not only in Japan. Uh, the Sengaku Ren, they have been found in 1948, but then in the 60s, they started to split so that there existed five groups that called themselves Sengaku Ren. Um, can you tell us something about the Sengaku Ren and the dynamic of this group? Yes, Sengaku Ren, it's very, very complicated. Um, basically, it's it's easier to think about it as a federation or a kind of network of different student groups. Um, so the student groups were, were formed at universities, for example, student clubs or, or faculties had, a, had an independent, uh, self-running, self-organized group. And this would be affiliated with Zengakuren, which was originally a national movement. Um, But when there was the first split between the Communist Party and the New Left in the 50s, already within the Zengakulin, there were some groups that were claiming to be supporters of the, the Communist Party and their youth group. And others were saying, no, we are supporting this, this new group that come called the Bund. Um, so already there was very early on, there was actually a split even before the 60s. Um, and then after the, after the, the first split, 
security treaty, uh, the, the AMPOL movements in 1960, again, it, it collapsed even more. And then, we, and then basically, Zengrakuren stops being a kind of national movement. And instead, it's dominated by different factions. So different new left groups um, and their affiliated student uh, councils and student groups um, all, all claim to be Zengakorem. Um, so maybe the most, most uh, interesting thing is that quite early on, Zengakorem was a very militant and aggressive and energetic force. It was one of the leading forces uh, campaigning against the US military bases in Japan from the, you know, from the 50s onwards. So it already had its very, very strong reputation as a kind of rebellious, um, anti-social, uh, you know, anti-authoritarian group from, from very early on. And, and that got stronger and stronger until even now today, the name Zengakuren has all these kind of associations of quite negative, actually, quite negative associations. But I mean, actually, who really is Zengakuren is a bit complicated. Um, so during the 60s, different factions started to link together for certain, certain protests and certain struggles. So then you have, then Zengakuren becomes almost a national group again. But, I mean, officially it's three or four different groups who are each calling themselves Zengakuren because they have different factions, but they are trying to link together and form a national movement. But um, unfortunately, it was never really able to become truly national again like it was originally. Uh, and today Zengakuren still exists, actually. There are some groups that still use the name, and probably most famously is the the youth group of what's called the, the Central Core Factions, the Chukakuha. Uh, their their student group, Zengakuren, is is actually very active today. Um, it's obviously quite small numbers, but they are quite active at Kyoto University and uh, some other universities around Japan, and they often appear in the in the, the Japanese media, the Japanese press. So there is quite a lot of interest in them still, uh, and they're they're doing some interesting things. While their their ideology is still quite um, still quite fixed in in uh, 1670s mentality, but they are trying to adapt and use new kinds of ways to appeal to young people today. Beside the Sengakuren, there existed some other left-wing students groups in Japan. For example, the Beheiren. I don't know if I uh, pronounce it right. Beheiren, maybe you know it. Uh, what can you tell Beheiren. us about? Beheiren. Mm -hmm. Beheiren. Mm -hmm. Yeah. What can you tell us about them? Maybe also um, indifference to um, the Sengakuren. Yes, Beheiren um, was. Uh, it was. It was. It's, it's, people tend to when they said the new left again. We we think a lot about students, but actually groups like Beheiren were also part of the new left because it was a new kind of left wing movement. Um, uh, Beheiren was was very loose. It was very decentralized. It was a group founded um, as an anti war anti war group. It was against the Vietnam War, and. Uh, They organized some very, very large protests and rallies um, in Tokyo and elsewhere around Japan. Uh, it, was, it, it was associated with many famous people, many famous intellectuals and writers. And it was very easy to make your own local Beheiren group. So that meant it became very quickly it spread around the country. And uh, it, was, it was very good at spreading information as well. And so it was a huge information network. It's obviously long, long before the days of you know, the Internet. And so it was very, a group like Beheiren was very important for forming networks of information around Japan. And this was also very useful because it was, the group was engaged in some illegal activities or some activities which were, were semi-illegal, let's say. For example, it was helping American soldiers to, dis to desert. So they were in their military bases in Japan and they were going to be sent to Vietnam. Beheiren was, was helping these soldiers to to go AWOL, to leave their bases and to be hidden in Japan somewhere for a while and then taken by boat out of Japan to somewhere like Sweden and going via Russia and Europe. And so Beheiren had actually a network of people around the country but also around the world of Beheiren activists and supporters who were helping to, uh, to um, escort these American soldiers or ex-soldiers to uh, neutral countries. And so that's one of the most famous, famous things they did, actually, in addition to the, the large scale protests.
When we talk about 1968 in, in, in France, for example, you can see that the month May has been the most important month, uh, the famous Parisian May 1968. I heard in Japan it was the October. In October there happened uh, very intensive fights between students and police and also the workers started to become a part of this conflict. Um, there's uh, the keyword of the attack of Tokyo. Can you tell us what uh, happened in October 1968? Yes, I mean, Japan also has these sort of famous dates and famous events where there was a, a, a climax or a, a famous confrontation. But uh, it, it is more spread out. There's several of them rather than just one. Um, so one of them is, yeah, October, October 21st, the, uh, the famous uh, international anti anti-war day protest. But actually, again, it wasn't just 68. It happened in the next year in 69 as well. And so both times there was a very, very, um, a very large street protest in Tokyo, which became became riots, and there was a lot of destruction and a lot of disruption, disruption of trains and stations, and a lot of you know a lot of damage to property and uh, hundreds of arrests and uh, lots of injuries as well. And the, the the driving force was again these these new left groups who were mostly students. There were also some workers involved. Uh, there was one quite famous. Um, Uh, anti anti war worker group which uh, um, which attracted quite a lot of uh, quite a lot of young people um, young young people young workers um, who were, you know some of them were about the same age as the students but they were not actually at universities um, but also the major labor the major uh, labor unions also on this day held 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 rallies you know officially peaceful ones as well but uh, other than other than the October Uh, the famous October riot um, in 68 and 69. There are also many other famous incidents. Um, so it's it's hard to find a, a single key month or a single key key uh, key day. But you know, for example, in January 68, there was very famous uh, riots in the south of Japan because a, a um, an American submarine was visiting, as an American air aircraft carrier was visiting, and uh, lots of students went down there, and there was large confrontations with police. Um, and likewise, um, likewise, in, at the beginning of '69, in January '69, there was a very, very famous uh, confrontation between thousands of riot police and many students at the uh, University of Tokyo, which is the most famous and most prestigious university in Japan. And this was the kind of climax or grand finale of the uh, student movement at the University of Tokyo, where they'd been occupying parts of the campus for a long time on a student strike and uh, finally you know because it's a national university they said enough is enough and they sent in the they sent in the riot police and I mean probably the most famous images of this period um, in Japan would be of the main hall at the University of Tokyo whilst just completely surrounded by police with water cannons And uh, you know, the, the the halls are the the windows and everything is covered in flags of the, the left wing student groups. And um, so this was you know it was it was a very famous media incident. People watched it on television at the time, and it was very dis very uh, destructive. Um, the university was basically smashed and, and, and heavily damaged, and they had to cancel the entrance exams for the next academic year. So that was seen as a very, very, uh, very landmark event in the movement. But actually, it happened in '69, not in '68. So sometimes this sort of the, the 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 language becomes a little bit unclear. Really, when you say '1968 in Japan, you you also kind of mean '69 as well. There was a lot of overlap. From what you said and also from what I read about um, 1968 in Japan, it seems to me as if the confrontation between the new left groups and the police and the state was um, very intensive, very militant. You also said that the Sengakuren was a very militant group. And yeah, to me, it seems that of, it was very violently. And is that a right impression? And um, maybe, you know, the reasons why it was so violently. Also later in the 70s, when the armed groups became a part of the movement, it, uh, it has very violent dynamic is that right yes i mean it was violent you can't deny that um i think sometimes people from that generation or people who are part of the movement sometimes uh don't like to talk about this but um it, undeniably it was violence and and many people did die um so uh, 
a lot of the first people who died were were student protesters actually who were killed by accidents in the in the in the crowd most famously in 1960 but also there were several others later on in the, in the 60s um also some riot police also died you know for example by accidents um i think that one of the real reasons it was violent well first of all there was this yeah the state versus the student groups or the new left groups and that was but that was violent but then also there was between the left wing groups there was fighting as well so there was the, the communist party group uh fighting against um some of the new left groups and then even more so the new left groups started to fight amongst themselves and this was violent um this was violent fairly early on but it got more and more violent from the end of the 60s and into the 70s um there are several reasons why that i mean uh one of the thing is the the pressure there was so much pressure on these activists like i said there were thousands of police um surrounding some of these campuses sometimes and so the only way to to um to not be to be arrested is to fight back um you know it was very difficult to get your message across otherwise you'd just be lost and you'd be arrested and you'd be out of you know the 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 japanese legal system is quite harsh and you could be arrested and held without trial for a long time um it wasn't the case where you could you know continue to communicate with people you'll be you know be gone from public sight so i think people sometimes saw you know it was almost like a fight for death sometimes you you basically if you get arrested that's it you're out you're out for several years at least so i think there was a sense of pressure and desperation but then it got worse uh because of all the defeats you know when when you've been when you've been defeated it makes you more angry and uh certain groups react in different ways and so then other groups were blaming each other for the way they were they were acting you know calling each other you're a tra- you are a traitor you did not stay to the end of that particular fight um you know there was this sort of um there was a sort of tip for tat accusations between the different groups and that escalated the violence um from from basically 1969 onwards and uh, we started to see a lot of infighting uh, and most most of the most of the people who died are actually these new left groups killing each other actually um although there were there were um some police deaths as well and some deaths of um protesters by police um actually the majority of deaths were between between student groups and that had a very very negative impact upon the whole movement um you know it, the new recruits were put off because these groups seemed more and more extremist and more and more uh, isolated from each other um and so it created a very negative impression about the whole movement and that that has lasted until today even now people have a negative impression of these groups uh because of what happened really really actually afterwards but they kind of don't realize the history is a little bit confused now and people tend to think mostly about what happens after the peak of the protest actually um and they forget that you know it wasn't always so violent i would like to talk about the topics uh, of the movements in the 60s again um from what you said um one of the most important topic was the vietnam war of course it was a worldwide protest against the vietnam war and also very important uh, was um yeah the protest against that uh, japan supported the usa in the block confrontation so as a first question these two topics um was they the most impor- uh, important topics or have there been also other topics who was important for the movement well there were, yeah there were many many um issues and many topics became important at different times um but and also some of these topics became kind of conflated they kind of joined together and if you actually unpack them you can see several topics but they would often be kind of pr- the protests would join them all together because they seemed at the time to be almost the same big issue. Um so the Vietnam War, the war issue is a is a case in point because if you protest the Vietnam War in the late 60s in Japan, you are protesting actually many things. You are protesting the security treaty between Japan and America. You are protesting the presence of the US military bases in Japan. You are protesting the continued occupation of Okinawa by the United States. um you're you're protesting uh the the way the Japanese government is allowing 
uh, America to use uh, Japanese property and Japanese resources um, as part of the war in Vietnam. You know, planes were taking off from Okinawa um, to bomb to bomb Vietnam. So there was an, Japan was basically, even though it had an anti-war constitution, was actually part of this war machine. Um, even for example, the protests against Narita Airport. Uh, this was not just about the farmers and their land being taken from them. At the time, people associated with the, the, the airport construction with developing a, another uh, facility that could be used for war, you know, for, for planes coming in and then going off to bases or flying off to the war zone. And so even, even that protest was part of something much bigger. I mean, there were other some more isolated issues as well. For example, one of the big issues in the middle of the 60s was about the, the treaty between South Korea and Japan, where they normalized relations again. And it's actually still a problem today, because at the time, South Korea, you know, was not a regular democratic country. And uh, so people saw the treaty as, as not really settling the problems of Japan's war legacy. Um, and so today, actually, one of the main reasons uh, there are still problems in South Korea and Japan is because of this treaty, actually, and how the things it did not do and things it did do. Um, so that was, for example, a, a slightly more isolated movement in the middle of the 60s. But in general, as, as you study this period in Japan, more and more, a lot of these movements, a lot of the issues kind of overlap and become one. And there's a certain amount of confusion about that as well. I think for us here in our talk, it's only possible to give a little overview about what happened in Japan in 1968 and um, yeah, in the 60s um, to set some spotlight. So for us, it's not really possible to follow the development then after 1968 after. But maybe as a last question, um, in the Western countries, 1968 became kind of a symbol, a symbol that marks a series of changes that happened then. Did 1968 also change Japan and in which way did it? Yeah, that's a, that's a fantastic question, and it's a, a really big one as well, and something I think a lot about. It's, it's in some ways it's easy to answer, in some ways it's difficult to answer. I mean, easy to answer is yes, because you know today the generation who are now basically about retiring age all have some direct connection with what happened. You know, they they either they either participated or they observed directly or through television what happened. And it, it was a seen as a very much the climax of the youth movement in Japan, and uh, it's sometimes looked back on with nostalgia as an exciting time. And there's a lot of you know films and books about this, and you know people have memories about their student strike. Um, so it's definitely a huge cultural event which left a large mark on a whole generation, and some of it very positive. Uh, but it becomes more complicated when we see that after. Afterwards, the student movement, the New Left movement, began to decline um, quite quite rapidly, and that was for, for many reasons: um, the, the violence, for example, but also the way that the the state and the police were were reacting to the groups and putting a lot of pressure on them to to uh, to put them into decline. And there was a, a new law was passed, which also allowed police to go onto campuses campuses more easily and break up student strikes. So in some ways, um, it's, a, it's very much a turning point because it marked the time when the, 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 the nation state, the state, turned around and said, okay, enough is enough. We won't let this happen anymore. And of course, it's not as simple as that. Actually, many movements did continue and it, was, it didn't always suddenly stop. But there was definitely a point where You know, there's a very, very large youth population. And t t today, Japan's population is in decline. Young people is going down. But at the time, the number of young people was very, very high in Japan. And, and they were basically, you know, thousands and thousands of them were aiming, aspiring and aiming towards certain causes. And they were basically stopped by the state. Um, you know, either, either at university level or these sort of national protests or these large Uh, protests and riots, and they were basically, you know, they couldn't succeed, they couldn't win. And I think that's had a very strong impact upon people. And it's one of the reasons why I think people are quite cynical now about politics in Japan, 
And al although, of course, some people are, are to China and lots of opposition parties and lots of political groups, and including some young ones, I think that the o overall legacy of 68-69 is, is that of, of, of failure, of defeat. And uh, I think it, that's very hard for regular people to see beyond. And I think it's one of the reasons why today, you know, there, there isn't much politics of hope in Japan. It's not like we're seeing in other countries where charismatic leaders on left and on the left and the liberal side can emerge easily. You know, it basically doesn't happen very much in Japan. Um, very much the conservative groups have managed to stay in power almost almost the entire period since the end of the war. Um, and I think one of the reasons for that is this this, this failure of the movements and and the way now it's remembered primarily as as a failure. Yeah, when you talk about the remembrance, it's a very interesting question because in Germany this year, in the public, there was a big focus on 1968. So it's uh, the fifth anniversary, 50 years after 1968. Many books has been released here in Germany, many lectures um, and articles about 1968. Is it also a topic in the media in Japan? Yes, very much so. Lot, lots of um, exhibitions and events and, and books and so on have been appearing But not not only because of the 50th anniversary of 68. Actually, this is this remembering this this, this process of of um, re-remembering, let's say, has been ongoing actually for 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 about 10 or more years. Actually, um, uh, in Japan, there's there's been a, a large increase in the number of books and documentaries and TV programs and exhibitions and events, you know, symposia, etc., etc. Um, uh, you know, since basically 2000s. Um, so there's, um, and I think maybe this is because there isn't a single, it wasn't, in Japan, it wasn't only 68. Like I said before, there are several other key events that are in different times. So maybe that's, maybe that's why it, the, the, the process of remembering is, is spread over several years rather than just one year. Um, and I think also it's because the generation that were involved, of course, are getting older and approaching retirement age. And so they are getting nostalgic and, and writing books and want to appear in public and, and tell people about what happened. But um, yeah, this, this, this process of remembering has been ongoing and, um, and I hope it continues as well because um, you know, for a long time people did not talk about it actually. Um, and for a long time there, were, there was books and information but it was not, in, not so mainstream. Um, and so, so it's wonderful to see Uh, an explosion of, of information and discourse about the movement. Some of it, of course, not so accurate, uh, some of it a little bit biased maybe, but it's wonderful to see this discussion happening and I hope it continues.